a very good morning everybody so today's lecture is on management of class 3 malocclusion and crossbite and at the end of the lecture you must be able to identify the etiologies of both and also plan the treatment so as we all know what a crossbite means it's a malocclusion in a transverse plane if you look at the picture normally it is the maxillary teeth which should be outside all over compared to the mandible that means placed buccal or labial if you have an opposite relationship like on this side then we are going to call it a cross bite so this is a posterior cross bite or you can have an abnormal oval jet that means rather than maxillary anteriors being labially present it is the reverse mandibular anteriors are present labially so this is a reverse over jet so this will be called a anterior crossbite so this abnormal relationship is termed as crossbite which can be anterior or posterior in nature we can also have skeletal crossbite whose etiology is skeletal in nature that means it is the maxilla which is deficient or it can be the mandible which is in excess or it can be a combination of both occurring together so a skeletal crossbite can be due to various syndromes, most commonly hemifacial microsomia, clefting syndromes which we as orthodontists encounter very frequently and craniosynostosis. So if you look at a cleft palate patient, despite of the closure and the repair of the cleft which was present, it is the scar tissue which inhibits the growth of the maxilla and the entire maxilla fails to grow in all the three directions and hence the maxilla gets collapsed inside the mandible and you find a complete crossbite in such patients so this is the most common crossbite that we as orthodontists face moving on to dental crossbite which is comparatively easier to treat there can be various reasons it can be due to trauma to the deciduous dentition which can lead to a displacement of the permanent tooth part and hence it erupts palatally in a cross bite relationship in relation to the mandibular anteriors or it can be because of prolonged retained deciduous tooth which may deflect the path of the erupting permanent tooth and again make it erupt in a palatal direction or it can simply be severe arch length tooth material discrepancy and lower teeth are fanned forward and the upper teeth are inside or it can be supernumerary teeth in the lower arch like this which makes it bite in a forward direction and there is a cross bite or it can be the reverse it can be less number of teeth in the upper arch which makes the upper arch collapse and come inside compared to the lower or this is interesting there can be a functional or muscular cross bite that means it will be due to a muscular imbalance so the muscle which can which is the most powerful in the oral cavity is the tongue so it is the abnormal position of the tongue which can lead to this kind of crossbite example if you have a habit like thumb sucking so you can see on this cephalogram thumb is occupying the position which should ideally have been occupied by our tongue so tongue has been displaced downwards <clears throat> so anything any habit which displaces a tongue downwards is going to lead to a functional or a muscular cross bite by impairing a buccinator mechanism and equilibrium theory that means tongue is down so if we look at the dentition from outside only the cheek and the lips will have a restraining effect on the entire dentition and from inside there is no tongue to counteract this restraining force hence the entire maxillary arch will collapse and come inside of the mandible and there will be a cross bite which will be muscular in nature similarly all other habits like mouth breathing which will take the mandible down and also the tongue along with the mandible goes down leads to alteration in the buccinator mechanism equilibrium theory and a constricted maxilla a functional crossbite would also mean that during function only you see a crossbite appearing function as in occlusion so when you try to bring the maxillary and the mandible teeth in contact not at rest only in contact you realize that a cross bite is appearing during that function so that functional shift can be just in posteriors as you can see in this picture or it can be happening in the anteriors 
So if you look at this video, you see carefully there is a unilateral posterior cross bite which is happening on this side where the maxillary teeth are inside and mandibular are outside, buckly placed. And you also see a midline deviation only in occlusion, not at rest. That means there is something going wrong when the patient tries to bite, bring the teeth in function or occlusion. That time there is an occlusional deviation creating a cross bite on one side and also an obvious midline deviation. So there can be various causes, occlusal abnormalities, it can be the abnormal inclination of certain teeth or a high point, a high filling. So we need to find out the etiology and eliminate the same and not treat it as a true cross bite. So depending upon the location, we can categorize a cross bite as anterior in nature, which can be limited to a single tooth like this or can be limited to an entire segment. Then you have a posterior cross bite which can again be limited to single tooth or can be segmental in nature. Or you can have a combination of anterior and posterior cross bite which can be called as a complete cross bite. So if you go to posterior cross bite you can also say it categorizes it as a unilateral that means on one side and also bilateral that means occurring on both the sides. So moving on to the treatment. So treatment will vary depending upon the etiology and the age. So suppose you have a growing patient where it is just dental in nature. So only the inclination of maxillary tooth is a fault and the tooth is still developing. So we can easily change the inclination of the tooth by using a tongue blade appliance. Make the patient hold the appliance and apply pressure onto the maxillary anteriors. Using it as a fulcrum on the lower anteriors and push the teeth forward. Or if the compliance is doubtful then we can cement a lower inclined plane also known, known as the Catalan's appliance onto the mandibular anteriors which will have a particular inclination and it will help glide the maxillary anteriors in this way in a forward position and hence correct a cross bite once we remove the appliance. Then if the cause is a maxillary tooth which is retroclined so that single tooth is in cross bite we can simply push that tooth using the z-spring appliance which you're fabricating in your preclinical and just push it forward or we can even use cross elastics which can be done along with the fixed appliance or it can be limited to a single tooth also so you, you can look at the molar over here so you need to put an attachment palatally on the upper molar buccally on the lower molar and stretch a rubber and this elastic will correct a cross bite. So if you look at this video, we can also give it along with fixed appliance. So I have given a soldered an attachment on the palatal aspect of the maxillary molar. We stretch the rubber from there to the buccal attachment. And then as this rubber comes back to its original position, it brings the teeth along into the normal position. So you can correct, but remember both the teeth are moving in this. So both the teeth to which you are connecting the elastic must be at fault for this otherwise you have to make sure that one tooth which is normally positioned or correctly positioned does not move by reinforcing anchorage for that particular tooth so next is your passive expansion so i'm sure we all must be able to recognize this appliance this is a myofunctional appliance frankel appliance with the lip pads in the mandible in the mandible means it is for mandibular growth that means class 2 malocclusion anyways regardless of it being for class 2 or class 3 the frankel appliance has the property of causing passive expansion of both the arches and we can choose which arch we want to expand more and depending upon we give a higher thickness of a buccal shield in that area because it removes the restraining effect of our cheeks and the lips and it lets that particular arch to expand freely without any active force and if you want to apply an active force then we all know we can actually do active expansion which can be rapid expansion if it is skeletal in nature or if you just want it to be dental then it must be slow in nature so for slow expansion there are various appliances which can be used which can be the NITA expander, the W, the quad helix and the coffin spring out of which coffin spring is the one which you are using which you are making in the preclinicals and quad helix is the one which is most commonly used in the clinic. Then orthopedic expansion that means skeletal expansion we know can be done by our most commonly it's the hyrax appliance which will cause a split in the suture or if you want to do a skeletal expansion in a non-growing adult then we can also resort to 
Sarpe. Moving on to the next section of our lecture, which is the treatment of class 3 malocclusion. So we can all look at this picture. So we have this Bollywood star and the three famous personalities are here. So now look at the first picture of Rajni Khan. We have the mandible made prominent. How does, it, how does he look? Do you think his looks are improving? Looking at the second picture and now the third picture. What I want to emphasize is most of the people think that for males, a class 3 malocclusion or a forwardly or a prominently positioned chin is aesthetic in nature. Though it is your individual preference, of course. And it all goes down to this Habsburg jaw family. So this lady, as you can see, from right there to right there. So it's been running in their genes. It's a royal family in which this class 3 malocclusion has been running in their genes. Hence, class 3 malocclusion is said to have a very, very strong genetic correlationship. And of course, it's there in many of the syndromes, just like a crossbite, because it's very, very similar. You have your Apert, Scrausen's, achondroplasia, Down syndrome, and acromegaly. And according to the cause, there can be various reasons. It can be bony in nature, that means because of maxilla and mandible being at fault, or it can be muscular, as we've already learned, or it can be merely dental in nature. The various components of class 3, just like your crossbite would be, it can be due to a mandible being at fault, it can be because of a retronathic maxilla, or it can be because of combination of prognathic mandible and retronathic maxilla. So if you look at the dental assessment, class 3, that means there is a bony problem. And dentally, how will you see? The patient will present with the following relationship. There will be a reverse overjet anteriorly. There can be an underbite, not overbite. Most commonly, such patients will have a narrow and crowded maxilla. And the mode of treatment, the easiest would be that we expand the maxilla if this is the etiology, which can be again by various ways, passive expansion, active expansion, slow versus rapid, depending upon the age of the patient and the etiology. Now, there is something very interesting in this part. It is called your pseudo class 3 malocclusion. This is similar to your functional or muscular crossbite. Okay, so now this one is a video for your anterior pseudo class 3. So the patient, when coming in occlusion while the patient is biting, he, he is sliding the mandible in front. So this is a forward shift of the mandible during occlusion but the patient actually is not class 3 it's only during occlusion that there is some occlusional prematurity or probably the retroclination the wrong inclination of the maxillary teeth which is making the mandibular teeth go in front and bite so the patient is not actually class 3 but is looking like a class 3 so it's a pseudo class 3 and there can be various reasons for the same it can be the ectopic eruption of maxillary central incisors, premature loss of deciduous molars or anomalies in tongue position as I've already explained or even nasorespiratory or airway problems. That means patients who have increased tonsillitis in order to make sure that the tongue does not go back because that might hurt them it, on touching the tonsils. They have a habit of bringing the tongue in front. Along with that, the mandible also grows, goes in front. So they have an habit of biting in a forward mandibular position with a forward shift of the mandible. So they're not actually class 3, but they look class 3 on examination. Hence, their careful functional examination is extremely important for you to be able to diagnose whether they're true class 3 or pseudo class 3. And remember, if they are left untreated for a long period of time, then such pseudo class 3 can easily turn into a true class 3. And of course, minor transverse maxillary discrepancies. Now, the treatment part will again depend upon the etiology of malocclusion, which is present. So, suppose you have a growing individual with normal maxilla and prognathic mandible. I'm not treating again with diagnosing here. I'm just treating with treatment. So, how do we treat growing individual with the problem is with the mandible. So, we want to restrain the growth of the mandible. That means we are going to give a restraining mandibular appliance 
growth is still left that means we can redirect it so we can give a we generally have to apply heavy forces to restrict the growth and we that means orthopedic appliances and to enable the growth or stimulate the growth myofunctional appliances do equally good but here we have to restrain hence we are going to choose on applying heavy forces that means orthopedic appliance to restrain the mandibular growth that is your chin cup appliance so we take support from the head and we pull the chin or the mandibular growth upward and backward so there can be various types of chin cups that you can use depending upon the direction in which you want to pull the mandible and if you have an adult with a similar problem where mandible is grow has grown too much there is no growth remaining and patient wants correction of that how do we correct that since there is no growth remaining and skeletal correction needs to be done the only resort left will be a surgical treatment and it is the mandible which is in front so we have to cut the mandible and take it behind so it's going to be a mandibular setback surgery we cut the mandible take it behind and we splint it at the corrected position so there are going to be phases of pre-surgical orthodontics followed by surgical orthodontics and then post-surgical orthodontics then we have a condition of retronathic maxilla that means now this particular class 3 is because of maxilla being retronathic and we need to pull it forward now there is a lateral cephalogram of the patient present there i have deliberately put it to tell you that while we are planning a treatment for skeletal problems we need to see the skeletal maturity indicators mere age is not going to tell you the chronological age cannot tell you the the amount of growth which is left in the bones because we are planning on treating the bones here that is a bony defect so we have to look at the skeletal age to plan the treatment so let's look at the lateral step and decide whether growth is remaining and which category we should put it in as growing individual or as an adult so we appreciate deep concavities on the lower border of the cervical vertebrae that means there is hardly any growth left in this individual and hence we can categorize her as an adult with a retronathic maxilla so we have to pull the maxilla out with no growth remaining so the only option left for us will be a surgical line of treatment of bringing the maxilla in front so we cut the maxilla and we can bring it down or front or whichever direction we want by a maxillary advancement surgery and then fix it in the correct position with our mini plates followed by a post surgical orthodontics now same problem now this one has got a mild prognathic mandible also but in a growing individual so how are we going to treat it growing that means we are going to modulate the growth again apply heavy force that means an orthopedic appliance which will be your face mask or a reverse pull head care so we take support from your forehead and chin there are elastics attached here and you pull the maxilla out which is retronathic in nature and it might have a mild restraining effect on your chin also which is controversial now if we have a problem with the adult where both the jaws are at fault you have a retronathic maxilla and prognathic mandible also then the only line of treatment would be a surgical line of treatment and that too addressing both the jaws so it will be a by jaw surgery where you cut the maxilla bring in front cut the mandible and take it behind and you get an ideal class 1 relationship so that's called a by jaw surgery okay so this is the ideal treatment plan i am discussing now we move on to a practical treatment plan rather than ideal one so there is something which is called as orthodontic camouflage so if you look at this picture do you recognize there is a fish in between which is trying to hide itself by adopting a look which is almost similar to the background so that it can be masked so this is called a camouflage it occurs naturally in the nature and we as orthodontists adopt this camouflage line of treatment sometimes to hide the underlying skeletal problem so a patient with class 3 malocclusion comes to you and says i don't want a surgical line of treatment because she is non growing and she wants that i want everything inside my mouth dentally i want everything to be corrected become class 1 
but I don't want my bones to be cut and taken into an ideal class 1 relationship. I have no problem with my face. I just want my teeth to be corrected. Just dental correction despite of skeletal problem. So when we try to correct the dental relationships and try to hide the real skeletal problem by doing so, we call it a orthodontic camouflage. Though not an ideal line of treatment, but it might be demanded by many of the patients. So if you look at the first one, camouflage compensation then so this is a patient with class 3 incisor relationship a class 3 molder relationship and patient says i don't want a surgical line of treatment no cutting of jaw bones i just want everything dentally to become class 1 so how do you think i should move the teeth the best way would be i remove this premolar that means a second premolar mesialize the upper molar get a class 1 molar relationship and to get a class 1 incisor relationship I need to bring the lower anterior behind so a tooth closer to the lower incisors compared to first and second premolar would be the first premolar so the idea of choosing the tooth is if you want to move the anteriors back it's always wiser to remove the first premolar which is comparatively closer to the anteriors and if you want the movement of the molar for easy molar correction then it is a second premolar which should be the choice of your tooth movement. Of course, other factors like any caries, root canal treated tooth, abnormally placed tooth which you think would be a better option in removing can be considered. But this is the ideal treatment option. Hence, I remove the upper second premolar, lower first premolar. We correct the molar relationship and also the incisor relationship. So this is called your camouflage line of treatment. So that means... You are compensating the dentition. That means the natural compensation which was already there in the dentition of trying to hide the underlying skeletal class 3 malocclusion. You have further compensated it and made everything look class 1 dentally inside. Okay. Now, if the patient looks like this and this patient is also skeletally class 3, and the patient has a problem with the face and he wants the real treatment of the etiology with the face looking perfect, mandible becoming less prominent and maxilla becoming more prominent. In that case, it is the orthognathic surgery which you should plan, which would be the ideal line of treatment for a skeletal class 3 malocclusion. In this case, your choice of extraction of teeth will also vary. Thus, you need to plan your treatment, discuss with the patient and then only remove the required tooth. Now, in this case, if you see, even if the patient is class 3, sometimes you see that the molar relationship still looks class 1 and even the incisor relationship is not that bad. It is somewhere between class 3 and class 1. It is not really a reverse overbite. That's because there is a natural compensation of dentition that has taken place. Remember, dentition always tries to compensate for the underlying skeletal problem. And despite of that, if you see a class 3 or class 2 relationship dentally, that means it is so severe. But many a times you see that patients are actually class 3 skeletally, but inside you see compensation which would have occurred so if the patient chooses only dental correction then we have to further increase that compensation by our camouflage line of treatment however if the patient chooses a surgical line of treatment then we have to do a decompensation of the natural compensation which is already there and then get the real extent of the skeletal discrepancy present and plan an appropriate orthognathic surgery so in this case, we are going to decompensate so that we see the real severity of the class 3 which is present in the patient. So we want to increase and make everything class 3 first. Everything will worsen in our pre-surgical orthodontics in such patient and it is our duty to inform the patient regarding the same. So I want to worsen everything. I want to make everything class 3. So which teeth you think I should remove? To make everything class 3, looking at the molar, I want to mesialize the lower molar and make it class 3. So it will be better for me if I remove the lower second premolar, which is contrary to what I removed for camouflage line of treatment. In the upper, I would like to take the upper anteriors behind to get a reverse over jet. So a tooth closer to the anteriors would be the first premolar. Again, contrary to the one we removed in the camouflage line of treatment. So here, my lower anterior also, they would be, if you see, in such patients who are skeletally class 3 and appearing dentally class 1, 
with compensation this lower anterior would have retroclined itself to the maximum possible extent so that everything looks class 1 so we are going to get the real ideal inclination of all the teeth first and then plan our treatment okay so we correct we worsen the molar and the incisor relationship we get the ideal inclination of the lower teeth so we get the ideal inclination of the upper teeth and now after we get the ideal inclination of all the teeth by removing the natural compensation we know how much of mandibular setback or maxillary advancement surgery in millimeters is required to get the ideal class 1 relationship hence this phase is termed as decompensation before planning an orthognathic surgery and our extraction pattern hence varies in both the lines camouflage versus orthognathic surgery now if the patient chooses a camouflage line of treatment that means we are correcting everything dentally only then the elastics that we will use to correct our molar relationship would be class 3 elastics which will be put like this from the upper molar to the lower canine or lower anteriors which will force my upper molar to mesalize and my lower anteriors to come back to get a positive overjet and we get everything class 1 dentally okay now the extraction patterns is not just one there are actually two extraction patterns which can be possible if we choose to correct everything dentally only that means camouflage and we just want to increase the natural compensation which is present so now I want to correct so one way which I already told you would be we remove the upper second premolar the lower first premolar put the patient on class 3 elastic close the space and we get everything class 1 so we get a class 1 incisor and a class 1 molar relationship also so that's the ideal compensation line of extraction pattern a second option for a faster treatment can be remember only end on molar relationship is said to be unstable class 1 class 2 or class 3 molar relationship all three are equally stable so we need not always correct the class 3 molar relationship into class 1 class 1 is not the ideal it is the normal normal means which is present in most of the individuals we need not remove an extra tooth just to correct the molar relationship if it is not required so so we can actually choose on if the class 3 molar relationship is perfect with no intersliding and there is a good posterior intercuspation we can just choose to remove tooth from the lower arch that means lower first premolars and get a positive overjet maintaining the class 3 molar relationship thus we save on two maxillary teeth so the choice is ours so as the lecture ends i would like to ask two questions only which i will be asking in the google classroom which will be initiated by me on monday so you just need to answer two simple things as a recap first if as an orthodontist i choose to extract lower fives and upper fours five means second premolar four means upper first premolars then what do you think is my treatment plan a camouflage compensation line of treatment or an orthognathic surgery second if as an orthodontist i choose to remove lower fours and upper fives then what do you think is my treatment plan camouflage line of treatment or an orthognathic surgery remember we are talking about class 3 skeletal malocclusion so i want you to think and tell me what is the treatment plan decided by me in both the cases thank you everybody stay safe